Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I call this episode, UFOs, Fast and Furious, UFO Car Encounters. As you may know, UFOs have a penchant for following cars down remote highways, usually late at night. There are literally hundreds of cases of this kind, not only of UFOs following cars, but hovering right over them, circling around them, causing the car engines to stall, uh, the electrical systems to fail. There are many cases involving physiological effects as well. And the question is, why are they doing this? And that's why I wanted to present this episode to you today to sort of take a deeper look at these UFO car chases and figure out what's going on here. What is the intention behind this? I have dozens of cases and I'd like to present them to you in a sort of chronological way. These cases are coming from all over the world. They reach back to the 1950s, earlier, I think. But I'm, the cases I'm going to present to you today reach from the 1950s through the 60s and 70s and up to the late 1980s. And this should just be considered a small sampling of the actual number of cases because there are literally hundreds of these cases in the UFO literature. And as I said, I think they have something important to say about the ETs, and frankly, about us as well. So let's just get started. The first case I'd like to cover comes from researcher Cynthia Hind, and it's actually quite a harrowing case. This occurred late one evening in 1952. Jean Povey, his sister and her friend, were driving from George, Cape Province, to Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Traffic was unusually light that evening when they were driving through the Storms River Pass, and coming around a corner, they saw a bright light blocking the road. Jean shouted out, Look out! And he swerved the car towards the retaining wall to prevent them from driving off the cliff. As he says, I remember shouting to the girls, Hold on and duck, when this bright light came straight at us. It seemed to just skim over the bonnet, the hood, lighting the interior of the car as bright as day. It shook the vehicle and with an almighty roar was gone. We just sat there too stunned to say a word, and needless to say, the only thing through our, in our minds was to get the hell out of there. So Gene said that he could actually feel the electricity coming from this object and all his hair on his body stood on end. His car was now stalled and it took him quite a while to get it started. He said he had to really battle at it. And when he finally did, they raced away as fast as they could. They drove for many miles wondering about what had happened and they had just reached the area about 25 miles from the city of Humansdorp when the UFO returned. As Gene says in his own words, guess what was traveling towards us, taking up the whole width of the road and just skimming the road like a bat out of hell. With no place to go, we just had time to pull off the road and pray that it missed us. Well, I can tell you, try and get three people under the dashboard. I know that I was tangled up with the clutch and brake pedals. I do remember that just before diving for cover, I saw that the thing seemed to change direction and come straight at us. It zoomed over the vehicle, missing by their proverbial hairbreadth, and as before, lighting up the interior of the car, then climbed steeply up and disappeared into the sky. This time they only heard a whooshing noise, and this object was gone. So this is a typical example of a UFO car chase. And here's another one. This next one occurred on April 5th, 1967, when a gentleman, a justice of the peace, was driving along Route 72 near jo Jonestown, Pennsylvania. The witness's name is John R. Demler, and he was driving along when his car engine started to sputter. It happened first once, then twice, and then three times, finally stopping. And then his headlights dimmed out and went off. 
It was then that John saw a 30-foot wide disc coming 30 feet high right over the road ahead of him. And it flew right over his car, he said, and then stopped right alongside it. At this point, he could hear what sounded like an electric motor. He saw sparking coming off the craft. And he also said he smelled a very strong and unpleasant odor, something like sulfur or camphorated oil. At this point, the object tilted and accelerated away at such speed that, according to John, he said his car, quote, seemed to be pulled to it. His car rocked and then settled down with such force that it was actually thrown across the seat. And the next day, he still felt the after effects. He was in a state of nervous shock. He said his whole body sweated profusely and that portions of his skin peeled off of his hands and feet. So this is a case that not only involves electromagnetic effects, but physiological effects, not to mention emotions. Many of these car cases are really quite dramatic. Certainly this next one is. This next case occurred on October 26, 1967, along the A32 highway in Reading, England. An anonymous bus driver was actually hauling a ton of machined titanium casings along the highway towards Reading. He had just passed the A30 intersection at Hook in Hampshire when his electrical system mysteriously failed and the engine died. So he got out of his vehicle, opened the hood and examined it, but saw nothing wrong. He got back in, into the car and then saw, at this point, a dark object hovering motionless over the road ahead of him. Uh, he really wasn't paying too much attention to it. He was trying to get his vehicle started, and it wouldn't start. But after several tries, it finally did. And he began driving again, but traveled only about 400 yards down the highway when the engine failed again. So again, he got out of the bus. At this point, he says he felt a strange pressure on his eardrums as if descending rapidly in altitude. And he also smelled a powerful electric odor. He inspected the engine and noticed nothing wrong. He confirmed that this weird odor was not coming from his engine. And looking up, he now clearly saw this same object it was now much closer. He says about 50 to 100 feet straight ahead of him, hovering right above the road. He estimates it was about 60 feet wide and 30 feet tall with a dull metallic surface. It was totally silent, and he watched it for several minutes when it moved horizontally away and off into the distance. At this point, he resumed his trip, but he said he felt quite strange. There was a numbness in his hands and feet, and he had a real difficult time controlling and moving his limbs. And here's another weird thing. He thought he would arrive 20 minutes late, given that he was interrupted by this UFO, but was surprised to find that he arrived actually 15 minutes early. He dropped off his fr freight and returned and got another surprise. He found that he actually used three gallons more petrol on the return journey than he did on the way there. And this was strange because it was the exact same distance and actually, on the return journey, he had a lighter load. So I'm not sure how to explain that. But there is a very strange final end note to this case. Because at the time, the witness was suffering from a bad toothache. But following this experience, his toothache completely disappeared. So this is a case of a healing. He does attribute this healing to the appearance of this UFO, though he's not sure how it happened. Perhaps it's something to do with the field of energy coming from this object. I don't know. It's hard to say, but it's another case involving not only electromagnetic effects, but physiological effects and that weird smell again. And here's another case moving forward to October 19, 1970. This is a really dramatic case which occurred in Norway. A man was driving on the road E18 
from Stavanger to Kristiansand in Norway, and he had just passed the city of Helland. The witness's name is Reeder Salveson, and he was driving at night when a bright light from his right and above shone down on him. It was so brilliant it blinded him. He could not see the road ahead of him. And this thing swooped down and hovered over his car. He estimates it was about 60 feet wide, uh, so quite large. And as the witness says in his own words, I opened the door and looked up. I will never forget what I saw. About 10 meters above, an object, round, shiny, and smooth, was hovering, which resembled descriptions I have seen of flying saucers. It stopped there in the air without any motion or noise at all. I stopped the motor and got out, standing by the side of the car. The object moved forward and stopped, almost as though sliding in front of the car. It was very close to him at this point, and without warning, Reader's legs mysteriously collapsed under him. He couldn't account for this. He felt no pain. Uh, he says he felt no fear. It all happened so quickly, but for some reason he just collapsed. And at the same moment, his windshield shattered. He quickly stood back up and watched this object lift straight up. It hovered high in the sky for a few moments and then darted off at high speed. He drove directly home and told his wife, and he said that after the experience, his mouth and tongue felt numb, and for a week afterwards, his eyes were sore and very sensitive to light. The only other effect he noticed at first was a small cut on his hand where he tried to break his fall, but he did notice that his hands seemed burned, almost like sunburned, and the day after, the skin on his hands peeled off. So that's just like the previous case. Now, he had no interest in publicity, but he did tell a friend who finked on him and informed a reporter, and this made the case become quite well known. And investigating the man's car, they did discover the windshield was completely gone, shattered. But they also found a dull spot just on the roof above the windshield. And also the clock in his car malfunctioned, but later worked fine. And as Reader, the main witness, wrote, I think it's impossible that it was a non-manned vehicle. It stopped with pre precision right over the car and slid a few meters so that I had an ideal position from which to view it. The object was very beautiful. It was pleasing to study its construction. In my opinion, a perfect one. So yeah, these are very close encounters, so there's no possibility of misperception going on here. And here's another case. This one occurred also in England on May 25, 1971, Eunice Rose was driving along the road between Oddstone and Hinckley in England. She was in front of the Belcher's Bar Junction near Highway A447 when she saw a bright glow ahead of her on the highway. Now she didn't think anything of it until she turned right at the Belcher's Bar Junction. And this is when her radio began to fade and then completely died away. Following this, her headlights dimmed and her car began to lose power. And this is when she now saw that this mysterious light was to her left. She pressed down the accelerator, but it didn't seem to work. The engine sputtered and the car came to a stop. The engine was still running, but it was sputtering and had no power. And as the car interior began to fill with light, she realized that this object, which had been about 100 feet away, was now moving closer. And as she watched, it went directly over her car. And as she said, time seemed to stand still. When it was right over her car, all her hair stood on end, and she watched it move off to the right and could now see that it was a glowing saucer shaped. She estimates it was about 35 feet off the ground. And once it got about 300 feet away, her headlights and radio came back on, followed by her car engine. 
She had no real fear, but she was quite nervous. And still seeing this light moving along, she decided to race away home. She did find out later that there was another witness to UFOs in this area at that time. But even more interesting was what happened when she returned home. She told her family and her 10 year old son was very intrigued because he said that right after she had left the house that evening, he saw a light, a strange light shining in his window and he assumed it was a car coming up their driveway, but rushing to the window when he looked, nothing was there. So that could have been the UFO actually following her. <laughs> I don't know, it's hard to say, but they thought it was unusual. And so many cases. Here's an interesting case from northern Sweden, which occurred on the E4 road near Ajabin. It was late at night on September 20, 1971, when the main witness, Sten Stuer Cedar, noticed strange beams of vertical light shining down in front of him. He first thought it might be the northern lights, but it clearly wasn't. And looking behind him, he saw that these beams were actually encircling his car. So he put the brakes on, but as he says, and I quote, the car continued to move forward. Then everything became black around me, completely blue black. The blackness seemed to be a dense floating mass of smoke that lay around me so that it was impossible to see anything. So whatever this was, it was so dense that his headlights couldn't pierce it. And at this point he felt an increased sense of atmospheric pressure, just like that other guy did. He put the car in first gear and at this point he came out of the blackness. He saw that he was about 600 feet further ahead on the road, uh, but these weird light beams were still surrounding him, and he could now see that this weird black mass was ahead of him and rising up from the ground. Uh, it was quite some distance away, about a half mile, and he estimates it was about 30 feet wide, and he watched it move up and off into the distance. He hesitated to report this to anyone, but interested to see if there were other witnesses, he finally decided he would. He reported to the newspaper and discovered that there were in fact two others who had also reported the same sort of object in the same area. He went back to the section of road but found no evidence of what had occurred. It's a very strange case. And here's another. This next one occurred during a road trip from Tolstoy, Manitoba in Canada to Thief River Falls in Minnesota. It was a Saturday evening in August 1972. Mr. Hall, his wife, and their four kids were traveling on vacation along Route 59 from Tolstoy to Thief River Falls when he noticed a very bright light. Now his wife, who had a bad cold at the time, didn't really look at it and just told him, oh, it's probably a radio tower. Uh, he accepted that explanation, but he watched this light for about 10 minutes and realized it was pacing his car, it was moving closer, and they started to look at it in renewed interest and were discussing what it might be when it suddenly zoomed directly towards their car. And as Mr. Hall says, in his own words, it lit up the interior of the car brighter than daylight, and all the children woke up. I told my youngest, Wayne, to use the flashlight and flash four times, short flashes, and immediately the object flashed back four times. My wife then took the flashlight and sent a series of long flashes and short ones. Immediately thereafter, the object did exactly the same this time coming even closer to the car. At this time, the car radio started to act up and the engine began to sputter and cough. Meanwhile, the interior of the car grew very hot and the engine quit completely. So the car at this point was slowing down by itself, so Mr. Hall pulled over. All of them were quite scared, especially his wife and children but Mr. Hall said he was also very much intrigued. And as he says, when I got out of the car, the UFO was directly overhead. 
It was very bright, and I felt a kind of prickly sensation all over my body, like small electric shocks. So he opened the car hood and instructed his wife to start the engine. The engine did turn over, but sparks were jumping from the spark plugs across the coil to the side of the car. As Mr. Hall says, I am a master mechanic, and believe me, I have never seen anything like this in my life. So this was a very unusual electromagnetic effect. At this point, another vehicle began to approach, and as it drew near, Mr. Hall tried to flag them down. But at the same time, this object darts quickly up until it's a tiny little point in the, scar, in the sky, and it looked just like a star. The other car refused to stop, just zoomed right past them. At this point, Mr. Hall's wife was able to start the car, which ran normally. So Mr. Hall closed the hood, got back in, and they took off. At which point, the UFO dropped down again and began to pace them again. As Mr. Hall says, My wife flashed our flashlight at the object again, and we received the same signal back. So they stopped the car again, at which point they could now see that this object was a large disk. And as they watched, something incredible happened. This large disk immediately released three smaller disks, which darted off in opposite directions. The large disk then wobbled and then darted away in two seconds and was gone. So this was quite a long event, as Mr. Hall says. We watched the object for two hours, and we were never harmed in any way. The object just stayed still in the night sky. I must describe my feelings as I stood there looking at the magnificent machine that I am sure must have traveled from another world, and who knows how far. After we were again on our way, my wife, who was most of the time very quiet, suddenly said that her cold was completely gone and that she felt really good. So what an amazing case. Not only are there electromagnetic effects, but multiple physiological effects. Uh, his, he felt these sort of electric shocks and she had a bad cold which disappeared immediately following this encounter. So this is another case of a UFO healing. And all of them saw it. It's a really amazing case. Here's another case. This is in 1976, and it occur occurred in Muret, France. The main witness is Monsieur Cyrus, and he was driving at night when he saw a dark object glinting in the moonlight, and it was just above the road directly ahead of him. And right after he noticed it, the object lit up and glided smoothly directly towards his car and then tilted to show its underside towards him. And in fact, it went directly over the hood of his car, right over it, about two to three feet up, and blazed it with a brilliant light. So this was very much obviously intentional. This object then shot straight up until it became a star-like object and what's really interesting is there was another driver about 450 feet away, and he watched this whole thing happen. He actually thought the witness's car had exploded. And so he drove up and helped Mr. Cyrus get out of his car, and they watched this object pulsated, sent down a beam of light onto Mr. Cyrus's car. He was in a complete shock and drove home in a daze, uh, he told his wife and fell instantly to sleep, which he says is quite unusual for him. And when he woke in the morning, he noticed that he had some vision problems. He had black spots in front of his eyes, though this cleared up after two days. And concerned, he made a report to the police. And it was then that he learned that there were two additional witnesses besides the other driver who had watched the whole thing happen. These cases are coming from all over the world. Here's a case which occurred in mid-December 1976 to two ambulance drivers from Whitehorse. This is in the Yukon, Canada area. Tom Banks and Kenneth Schofield 
were traveling along the Alaska Highway to pick up a patient and transport him to Whitefield General Hospital. Without warning, while they're on the Alaska Highway, a glowing object dropped down from the sky and began to pace their ambulance. They radioed police to say that they were being followed, because this object was following them. This UFO came very close at one point, and their electrical system began to malfunction, including the ambulance siren lights. After fiddling with it for a while, they finally got it to work, at which point the UFO seemed to be attracted to it and came swooping down over them, buzzing the ambulance by only a few feet. And as ambulance driver Kenneth Schofield says, We saw what we thought at first was a bright star. It seemed stationary, then all of a sudden it was right down over our area in no time. And as he said, it moved, quote, like nothing we had witnessed before. It followed them, they said, for about 20 minutes, it would dart back and forth, come first to the left and then the right. It was at very low altitude. And little did they know, other witnesses were seeing UFOs in that area at the same time. And further investigation revealed that only months earlier, at least three truck drivers driving along the same area of highway along the Alaska Highway heading for Whitehorse so that they were followed by a UFO for several miles. And in fact, some of them would pull into the way, st way scale station. And this object was also seen by the gentleman who worked there, Bill Bowers. So apparently there is something about this stretch of highway <laughs> that is attracting UFOs. Here's another really interesting case, which occurred in Galva, Iowa. While driving to his home in Galva, Iowa on the evening of April 13, 1977, Kevin King, who at that time was a sophomore in high school, was driving to his home just east of Galva. He came over a hill and saw four colored lights over the road about 300 feet ahead of him. And I'll just let Kevin describe in his own words what happened. As he says, Just after I noticed it, it changed directions and started heading right for me. When I first saw it, it was going north. And the lights were on top. Then it flipped over and started coming towards me. As it got closer, it came lower and lower and started moving real slow. He could see now that it was a disc shape and as it started to approach him, he stopped his car and turned off the engine. And as Kevin says, I was too scared to get out of the car. I just sat there. It was as wide as the road and went about two feet over my head. It was moving real slow, like it was studying something. So Kevin said it was close enough that he, if he had stood on his car, he could have easily touched it and he watched it move off to a grove of trees and then dart off. Little did he know that there were other witnesses. Deb Bush, pictured here, and at least two others also saw it, saying that it was just above the treetops, so low that they actually thought it might crash. So reporters interviewed the witnesses and actually called Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, who denied any knowledge of the case. But Lieutenant Havelka told reporters, and this is interesting, quote, If a UFO had been spotted in your area, it would be listed as classified information, and you wouldn't have any need to know anyway. <laughs> More evidence of a cover-up, in my opinion. And here's another case. This one occurred near Thaxted, England was on August 9, 1977, Mike Stevens, a postman and part-time musician, was driving along on the A130 road just past the town of Thaxted when he noticed an unusual red-orange glow alongside the road. And as he approached, he realized that this was unusual, and he pulled over and saw two objects about 1,000 feet away, one was slightly closer than the other, and they were hovering about 50 feet above the ground. 
One brightened and dimmed, the close one, and the other one seemed to move up slightly. And at this point, the closer object began to move towards him. And at this point, he realized that the objects were quite strange. He was the only one on the road. This was a quite remote area. And it was clear to him that these objects were showing an interest in him. So he became concerned about that and got back into his car and intended to speed off. However, when he pressed down the accelerator, the car would not accelerate. And he said even when he put the accelerator all the way down to the floor, the car would not go any faster. And this strange effect remained for about 400 yards. When suddenly the engine kicked in, the car surged forward at high speed. He nearly ran off the road. He jammed on the brakes and then quickly drove off and went to the police to report his sighting. And here's where it gets really interesting. UFO investigators heard about this case and they decided to inspect his car and his car revealed some very strange magnetic anomalies. They got another identical car, same make and model, and used it as a control sample. And using a compass, they made very different magnetic readings, as you can see here. Mike's car was clearly affected in some way by the close proximity of this object. It's a very interesting case. And here's another one. This one took place near Cannon in Vermont, and this was on the evening of August 4, 1977. The main witness is Pauline Pear, age 23, and her mother, Miss Irving Matthew, pictured here. And they were driving home after shopping when they said a UFO dropped down just a few feet over their car. And I'll just quote Pauline here because it's very interesting what she says. She says, It was brighter than other stars in the sky. As it grew closer, it grew brighter until it was above us. It was round, a saucer shaped, and a bright orange glow from lights underneath it lit up the whole road. We were terrified it was going to land on top of the car. Although I told my mother to close the windows on her side of the car, I had to roll down mine to see if it was still there, because it made no sound. And there it was, about the size of a car, just above us, zigzagging along with us, along this narrow, winding road. We were so scared. I told my mother to close her window and lock her door, and I put my foot on the gas pedal. But as the car turned and twisted, so did the thing, flying low over the trees, turning them orange with its glow as it kept pace with us. So it followed them for about 20 minutes until they reached the town of Cannon. And as Pauline says, it suddenly swerved away from us and was gone in seconds. The orange glow brightened up the woods, then vanished. So Pauline told several people around her, most of who laughed at her and didn't believe her. But she did receive multiple letters later from people who heard about the incident and said that they had seen the same UFO in the same area at the same time. So it's a very interesting case and like many of these involve outside witnesses. And here's a really interesting case. This comes from a reporter by the name of Gregory M. Cannon. And as he says, UFOs seem to love buzzing cars. Trucks, too, as the following case illustrates. So, yeah, he's right about that. It was around 2 a.m. on March 5, 1978, when a trucker was traveling on the Outback Highway from Lee Creek to Hawker in Australia. And without warning, the trucker blew a tire. And as he was changing the tire, he had this weird, eerie feeling that he was being watched. And he looked around him, but there was nobody there that he could see. He finished fixing the tire, got back on the road, and as he started driving, that's when he saw this blue-green light in front of him. He first thought it might be a reflection off a railroad sign until he flipped on his high beams, and he could see this object, which also flipped on red lights and darted to the right. 
At this point, he thought it was gone, but 30 seconds later, it dropped down right in front of his car, about 15 to 20 feet above the road. And as he says, it started to lower itself toward the road. And when it was about five feet off the ground, I switched on to high beams. So when he switched on his bright headlights, the object shot straight up. But seconds later, it dropped down again. As the driver says, it came back very soon afterwards, but would not come below 20 feet above the road. And it always kept 150 to 200 feet ahead of me, regardless of what speed I was traveling. I tried time after time to catch it, but the result was always the same. So we did this for about 15 minutes and finally flagged down another trucker to show him the light but right before he could point it out to the other trucker, this object flicked off its lights and was gone. So that's a pattern we've seen in a few other cases. Here's another case. This one is really dramatic. This occurred just outside of Indianapolis, Indiana on Highway 465, uh, one mile east of Highway 465 on Interstate 70 East. It was the evening of March 29, 1978. There were three truckers, two 18-wheelers, and a third super cab truck. They were all talking to each other on CBs as they traveled along Interstate 70. And they were on the lookout for cops when suddenly a mysterious and huge beam of blue light shone down on all three trucks from above. The same moment, all their CBs failed and the truck engines started to sputter. Now this was at night, but the highway was quite crowded. And in fact, an estimated 50 cars uh, and 100 people stopped on the freeway and watched this whole thing happen. This was quite brief. It lasted for about five seconds, this beam of light, and then it blinked out at which point the trucks began working and so did the CBs. At this point, the rear trucker got on his CB and started talking to the UFO and said, hey UFO, if you have your ears on, I want to go with you. And this was immediately when the same bright blue light came down again and again engulfed all three truckers. The trucks were forcibly slowed down to about five to 10 miles per hour Witnesses in the area saw the trucks actually jerking and jumping. So this case became quite well known. It was investigated by MUFON researcher Charles Tucker. And one of the truckers said that when the beam hit him, he felt this incredible feeling. And as this trucker says, it is the most peaceful state I have ever experienced. I did not believe in this crazy stuff before, but I certainly do now. I drive about 130,000 miles a year. I do not drink or use drugs. I have never experienced anything like this in my life. He says the incident affected him profoundly and he thinks about it constantly. And he also noticed another strange effect as he says, my clock is now losing about an hour a day. He wanted to get the names of the other truckers, but as he says, I was too scared. One of the witnesses who saw this happening from a car said that this beam of light, quote, looked like a big bright blue lampshade over the three trucks. Now, no actual UFO was ever seen, but what I find most interesting about this case, other than the fact that it did affect the vehicles electronically, was one of the truckers describing this beam of light and calling it the most peaceful state he has ever experienced. That's something I've heard before. There's something about these beams of light that can be very tranquilizing. It's certainly an interesting case. And there are so many. Here's another quite interesting one, which occurred on Log Cabin Road in Berea, Kentucky. It was November 27, 1978, and Faye Le Leisure, was, had just purchased a new car and she wanted to show her friend. So she, her brothers Philip and Michael, and their uncle, 
Theo Van Winkle got in the new car and drove a short distance down Log Cabin Road to their friends. And it was on the way home that night that they noticed a weird light following them. And as Philip says, it kept following us, right over us, while we were coming down the lane. They described this object like two bowls put together rim to rim. This brand new car, at this point, stalled several times. The object followed them all the way home. They exited the car and went to their porch and watched this object, while one of them dashed inside and called their neighbor Becky Allen. She arrived shortly later, and all of them watched as this object circled around the house several times. It was totally silent. And as their neighbor Becky Allen says, we don't know what it was, but we just want to be left alone. We've never been so scared in our lives. So, I don't know, I think I would find that very interesting. It hasn't happened to me, so I can't say how I would react. But yeah, a lot of these witnesses get quite frightened by these encounters. I think because they're so close, and it's clear that these UFOs are following them and have an interest in them. And again, all over the world, here's a really dramatic case which occurred in the large city of Belo Horizonte. This is just north of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Good witnesses in this case. It was 2.20 a.m. on October 18, 1979, when military police sergeant Dion Martin de Souza and three other officers, Manuel Braza, Geraldo Correa and João Florentino were all parked in a deserted section of the city and suddenly this object came down over their car about 300 feet away. Dion says that the light was as bright as an electric arc. And as he says, and I quote, I tried to get out of the car, but I felt a kind of half-paralyzed sensation. Then the car trembled, shook, and started to rock a little, back and forth. We tried to drive away, but the engine would not start, and the radio went completely out too. We couldn't understand what was happening to us. The UFO darted away, at which point the car did start. They called police headquarters, who ordered them to follow this object. So they chased it, and they caught up with it, and at that point, they said that they felt they were actually being controlled by the UFO. As Dion says, the four of us felt we were really in trouble. We felt we were under control of the UFO. The car shook and stalled, and the radio went out, and we experienced those paralyzing sensations again. So that went on just a short few moments, at which point the object moved away, and as it left, the entire city lights of Belo Horizonte blinked out once, and then a power failure struck one of the city districts. And there were other witnesses. About a half mile away, another officer, Captain Nairo de Assis Barbosa, and two others watched as this UFO darted up in the air. So this is another case showing amazing electromagnetic effects and apparently a power failure. Moving along to December 16, 1978. Esther Drew, age 37, her daughter Pam, and three others, George Nicholson and his young kids, Robin and Bobby, were driving along on Old Creek Road in Brownsville, Indiana, when they noticed that their car motor kept turning off and on by itself. Now, Esther was driving and she said, something is wrong with the car. She told that to George, the other adult, and he blamed her. But at this point, the radio went dead, and the car came to a complete stop, and it was then that this UFO appeared right in front of them. And as Pam, the daughter, says, it came over the top of the trees real slow. I thought it was going to stop. This object was quite low, it was about 10 feet above the ground, and the size, they said, of a small airplane. It had two lights in front and two on the bottom, and the object looked metallic. And as they watched it move right in front of the car, 
they felt it was almost as if it was inspecting the car itself. George Nicholson dr jumped out of the car while everyone else stayed seated. And as Pam says, it was like nothing we ever saw. I thought it was going to stop. But this object didn't stop. It kept moving. It went over a cornfield and then took off with a whooshing sound. At that moment, the engine and radio came back on. The witnesses continued to Brownsville without incident, but on the way back, the UFO appeared again. At this point, Esther was so upset, she told, said she didn't want, didn't want to drive, so she told George Nicholson to drive, and she said she didn't want to look out the window. That's how upset she was. And it was then, while passing Richmond High School, that her daughter Pam reported seeing at least three other objects. And again, the car engine started to fail. And this time, the objects followed them. As Pam says, I could swear they were actually following us. They made it to their home at 818 North 15th Street in Richmond and ran into the house. Uh, they didn't want to see the UFO anymore. At this point, they were too afraid to look outside so they didn't see how this object left. So you can see that this does affect the witnesses quite profoundly. Here's another case which occurred in Houston County, Alabama. It was the first week of March 1981. A couple from Wiregrass in Alabama were returning from a picnic in the afternoon when the husband first noticed a UFO following their car alongside the road at treetop level. Uh, it quickly darted off and was gone, and he thought that was the end of it. But then he noticed his wife sitting in a trance-like state, staring out the right side of the car, and he kept nudging her to see what was wrong. She just turned and looked at him in fear, didn't say a word, but stared back outside the right window. So he stopped the car and leaned over and was shocked to see this same UFO now hovering a mere 15 to 20 feet away from the right passenger side. And as he says, I was stunned. It was like nothing I had ever seen. I remember saying to my wife, it's really a UFO. Suddenly I was as stunned as she. So they got quite a fright and took off, he says, at a dangerously high speed. And, no surprise, the UFO followed. As the wife says, the faster we went, the faster it went. But the most amazing thing to me was that the thing didn't make any noise at all. It just kind of hovered there without any sound. They were on a small dirt road. There was only one way out. And they watched as this UFO darted ahead and disappeared around the corner ahead of them. And as the husband said, we thought the thing had finally decided to leave. But when we rounded that turn, there it sat. I thought my wife was going to faint. She just turned pale. The object was now only two feet off the road, blocking the road. <laughs> so they watched it in shock for about three to four minutes at which point it lifted up to treetop level, darted right towards their car, buzzing it, and then vanished into the distance. As the woman says, I'd always heard tales about so-called UFOs, but I never really believed any of them. Needless to say, she believes them now. Here's another amazing Fast and Furious UFO car chase, which occurred near Meredith, New Hampshire. This was in mid-November 1981. Linda Brown, her son Jeremy, and her friend were driving along Interstate 93 near Meredith, New Hampshire, when a UFO began to pace their car, and it followed their car down the highway, darting back and forth. They pulled over at exit 23, pictured here, to take a closer look. The object obliged and dropped down, and as Linda said, we were very frightened. She said this object was so big and so close it actually blocked the street lights. And as she says, you could lean forward on the front seat of the car and see it plainly through the windshield. 
It had two legs protruding from the bottom and was silent. So frightened, she drove to the nearest service station. The object followed them and parked right above the service station, about 100 feet high. She ran inside and told the owner to come and look out the UFO. Now, the owner's name was John Davis. He's the owner of the New Hampton Sonico service station. I believe this one pictured here is the same one, though I can't be sure of that. At any rate, John and a small group of people at the station watched this object for about eight minutes. And as John says in his own words, I was getting ready to close when this car came into the garage parking lot and these women got out of the car shouting and hollering and waving their hands. I thought they had car trouble. They said, look at the UFO over your garage. I said, what the heck is that? I don't know what it was. He says, it looked just like one of those flying saucers or spaceships, all silvery, with fluorescent lights on the sides, pulsating, not blinking, just throbbing, sitting there. So Linda told him that it had followed them down the highway. At this point, this object, according to John, was about 40 feet across and 100 feet high. And as he says, I'm not crazy. I don't believe in UFOs. And if I hadn't seen it with my eyes, I wouldn't believe it. So this object stayed for about eight minutes and then appeared to drift off. At this point, Linda Brown, her friend and son, left the station and continued their drive. And while heading down Route 104 towards Meredith Center Road, the object, <laughs> no surprise, reappeared. And at this point, Linda's friend and son said it appeared to be shooting down what looked like blue balls of fire from underneath it. Finally, it did disappear, but it left them all quite shook up. Linda said that if she ever saw it again, she would not report it, as everyone she had told teased her about it. Here's another case. This one occurred in Colne, North Yorkshire, England. This was investigated by Mark and Graham Birdsall, well-known UFO researchers. A family of four and their dog decided to go shopping. They left the town of Carlton, where they lived, and as they drove, two UFOs, one bright red and the other bright green, both about the size of a football, swooped down on either side of their car and began to pace it. And th these were real close up. They said they were right alongside the car at window height. Uh, they were absolutely shocked. The two kids in the back began crying and their dog was also affected. He cowered under the seat. The wife screamed at her husband to turn around and head back home, which he did, but these objects followed them. It was only for a short distance, and then these objects darted off, but this experience frightened them so badly that they now refuse to drive that road anymore, and they take the long way around to get into town. And it was only a day or two later, on March 4, 1982, that another witness, a businesswoman, was driving from Lancashire to North Lancashire on the A65 road when she had a nearly identical experience. Two small lights, one red and one blue, she said, swooped down and began to follow behind her car. And the next thing she knew, a white beam of light from above engulfed her car and 30 feet around it, actually. She says her car engine revved up. The light remained over her car for a full mile until another truck appeared, at which point the object darted away. Upon reaching her destination, she did realize she was missing a half hour of time and later did undergo hypnosis, which revealed a more extensive encounter. So yeah, at least a few of these cases might involve actual onboard contact, but most no, just seem to be these UFOs following cars down the highway. And again, all over the world. Here's the one which occurred, this is such an interesting case, along the South Coast Highway, when two women were traveling towards the city of Esperance in Australia. This is in early April of 1982, the two women, Frances Collins and Maggie Yend, were traveling down the South Coast Highway at around 4 a.m. 
and they had just reached this little town on the highway called Munglinup. It's really the only sign of civilization along this really remote highway. So they go past this town, and this is when this brilliantly lit object dropped down out of the sky and began to pace their car. And as they do in these cases, this object went from side to side, sometimes getting as close as 600 feet to their car. They said this object was about the size of a helicopter, but as they watched, it would change color from red and orange to green, and when it darted around, it would change color as well. They said it would go up, way up high, become a star-like object, and then drop down again. So when this first appeared, Maggie, who was driving, screamed, waking up her uh, friend, Francis, and screamed, there's a UFO coming at us. And this is when Francis woke up and saw it. And as she says, when I opened my eyes and looked out the windshield, my heart leaped up into my throat. Down the road and coming straight at us was a huge, blinking white light. It was well above the roadway, so we knew it wasn't just another vehicle. She said that at one point this object hovered right in front of them. And as Francis says, I thought it was going to run into us. I thought it was going to kill us. I remember saying to myself, oh dear God, it's going to hit us head on. It wants to kill us and we're going to die. But when it was only a few feet away, it lifted up and just hovered over our van. Then it lagged back a few feet and followed us. So here we see this very strong fear reaction. And it didn't help when this object continued to follow them. And it followed them for a long time, about 50 miles, 5-0. And as one of the witnesses says, it made absolutely no sound. And it followed us almost until we reached Esperance. And when they finally reached their destination, they went directly to the home of the local police officer, Bob Corden. And he was amazed to see how agitated the two witnesses were. He saw then that one of their tires was actually shredded. They had been driving on a flat tire. And looking up, this object was still there, hovering over the Esperance Bay in full view. Numerous other witnesses in the area did see this. Uh, our later researchers talked to two kangaroo hunters, a truck driver, and several other motorists on the same highway who saw this. And Francis and Maggie, the main witnesses, discovered a long history of sightings in that area. And this part is really interesting. They learned that just one year earlier, a man from Queensland was driving along that same stretch of road and disappeared. His car was found by the side of the road in perfect working order, but he was never seen again. George Hume of the Perth UFO Research Center said that the sightings by Collins and Yeend and others was one of the best documented in this area in recent years. So this was, of course, coming to the attention of UFO researchers. And in fact, in 1982, there were numerous incidents of car accidents being linked to UFO crashes. Researcher J. Allen Hynek was asked specifically about it, and he acknowledged the sudden uptick of cases, but he refused to speculate on the cause. Harold Gerson of MUFON said that most of the cases that he was researching came from the Midwest, and as he says, most are probably the result of fear and or surprise on the part of the drivers. It's not surprising that a driver would lose control of his car when he suddenly sees a UFO. Now, Leonard Falcone of the California Institute of Technology and a member of the organization UFO Watch in San Francisco specifically cited two cases of this kind. One involved two brothers in Missouri who said a UFO passed over their car, pinned them to the seats, and caused their car to zoom off out of control and into a ditch as though someone else were driving it. And a second case occurred in Menasha, Wisconsin, to two police officers who said they were struck by a beam of light from a UFO, which caused their squad cars to freeze and run off into a ditch. And according to Leonard Falcone, 
So far as I know, no one has been killed or seriously injured in any of the accidents. So yeah, this is far more common, I think, than most people realize. And moving along into the 80s, here's a case from the Latrobe Dairy area of Pennsylvania. It was around midnight on August 30, 1983, an anonymous gentleman was driving along Route 217 at the Kingston Hill cutoff, pictured here, when he saw a series of bright lights 40 feet over his vehicle. He could hear a high-pitched sound coming from above, and looking up, he saw a battleship gray saucer. He said it had amber lights around the perimeter and what appeared to be a door in the center. And this is a drawing here of this object. He drove off in fear, but the object moved with him, staying above and in front of his vehicle the whole time. He tried to outrun it, but it stayed with him, sometimes following, sometimes appearing in front. And he eventually reported it to the newspaper and learned that many other people in the area had apparently seen the same type of craft he saw around the same time in the same area. Here's another case which lasted for hours. This is in Melbourne, Australia. It occurred in mid-September 1983 when civilian aviation authorities in Melbourne notified police of an unidentified object on their radar screens. Two officers were sent out in a patrol car to investigate and were amazed to actually see this UFO hovering over a freeway leading into Melbourne. And they chased this object to a shopping center where it stopped and hovered 300 feet overhead. They turned on their spotlights, at which point the craft disappeared. Another patrol car with two additional officers was sent out. And for the next six hours, this UFO played kind of hide and seek and cat and mouse with these four officers, hovering at times only 100 feet overhead. This was shortly after the Frederick Valentic case in Australia where a pilot disappeared. Officer Peter Ferguson was, knew about the Valentic disappearance and it unnerved him as he says, I believe in God and I was doing some heavy praying. All I could think of was the thought of being abducted by space aliens and never seeing my family again. Officer Ray Ellens said, it was very hard to keep our minds on chasing the UFO because of the thought of what happened to Valentic. But once we calmed down, we actually got pretty annoyed. It was just too quick for us. At one state, it landed with its lights off. We got to within 300 feet of it and thought we got it this time. But the next thing we knew, it was back in the air and behind us again. Officer Paul Hickman says, the UFO was obviously playing fun and games with us. When we first spotted it, we got a spotlight on the strange object in the sky, which showed it was gray, about 300 feet long and 20 feet wide, shaped like a cigar. I've never seen anything like it before. It was awesome, and I must admit, frightening. Okay, I've got just a few other cases I'd like to present to you. And this next case occurred just outside of Seven Points Texas. This was in June of 1984. A mother and son, Carolyn Green, and her son Timothy were driving along Highway 85, six miles west of Seven Points, Texas, when a UFO appeared overhead and began to wreak havoc with her car. As Carolyn says, I was driving along at about 55 miles per hour when all of a sudden my lights began flashing on and off. Then something pulled me off the road, literally took control of the steering wheel. The car was suddenly driving itself. I tried to turn around, but I couldn't. Only then did they see a strange lighted object above their car. And as Carolyn says, the light came into the car and lit it up. My hair stood on end, and my son was frightened. I told him I didn't know what it was. Finally, after a few short moments, the UFO released control of the car, and Carolyn sped away as fast as she could, reaching speeds of about 75 miles per hour. It was then that a police officer actually pulled her over for speeding. 
Colonel explained to the officer that she was trying to escape a UFO. The officer did not believe her and gave her a ticket. And as Carolyn says, I'll be happy to pay the ticket, but what's important to me is that people believe I am telling the truth. So here's another case which occurred in the city of Waycross, Georgia. This was in August of 1984. The two witnesses, Danny Thrift and Janet Curry, were driving to his grandmother's house along Swamp Road. This is just a little rural road when they saw a glowing object hovering at treetop level alongside the road. Danny at first thought it was a plane, but as they got closer, he saw that it was unlike anything he'd ever seen. And as he says in his own words, it started moving fast and it changed direction. All of a sudden it was coming right for me, heading right towards the car. It scared me so bad, I started to cry. So this object, object hovered right over their car, engulfing it in light. And as he says, I was trying to speed away, and it kept up with me. It got right over the car and glided over us. I felt I was in danger. It lit up the whole inside of the car. I've never seen anything like it. I've never been so frightened in my life. So it followed their car for a short distance and it sent both the witnesses into complete hysterics. Suddenly, without warning, it was gone. They reached Danny's grandmother's house and immediately called the police. A deputy went out in his cruiser to investigate and returned to say that he too was pursued by the UFO, which came so close to his cruiser it nearly hit his car. And they later learned that at least six other people saw apparently the same UFO that same night in that area. An amazing case. Here's a case which occurred in mid-February in 1985. It was late at night when an unidentified woman was driving along the A392 highway near Mount Joy in England when she saw a hundred foot long oval shaped object alongside the road. And as she says, although brilliant, it did not radiate light. It was so powerful that it obscured my vision of the road. It hovered close to the hedge, then seemed to shrink, went pitch black, and moved from side to side across the road. It shrank down to a few feet, changing from yellow to green, then red, and finally purple before disappearing. Then, as she says, quite suddenly the light appeared on my right further down the road and followed the same pattern of changing color and size before disappearing. This happened six or seven times over a stretch of a half mile. So she slowed her car down to a crawl about 20 miles per hour and as she says, I was getting mesmerized. I was in such a panic that I turned off my route into the minor road just to get away from it. She reported it to the police, who tried to explain it away as a weather balloon or a reflection off of her windshield, but as she says, I know it was not that. She refused to drive back unless her husband came and accompanied her, and she wanted to wait until there were other vehicles along with him, because as she says, I was absolutely petrified. I had not drunk any alcohol before I left for work, and I do not take hallucinatory drugs. She refused to be identified, saying, People will only think I'm in that case, but I am not. All right, just three more cases, and I think we'll have a really good idea of what's going on here. It was late September 1985. This case occurred in Bagshot in, near Heath, Surrey when David McMurray, his wife, and their children, Katie and Paul, were driving from Bagshot to Farnsborough, Hampshire, in England. This was late September 1985, and as they're driving along, a UFO dropped from the sky and hovered directly in front of their car. And I'll just quote Dave McMurray directly, as he says, I saw something hovering above the road in front of us. 
I could not believe my eyes. It was a huge, saucer-like craft about 50 feet long, with brilliant lights coming from portholes around the center. Then it suddenly took off. But the encounter wasn't over yet. A second craft, or perhaps the same one, reappeared and began to follow them from behind. They kept driving, and after some moments, this UFO disappeared, but the effects of the encounter endured for days afterwards. As David says, the whole family was weak and trembling for days afterwards. And as his wife Susan says, I saw the two things with my own eyes. It was an incredible experience. And when David tried to start his car, the battery was drained. And as we have seen in many of these cases, there were other witnesses. They later learned that at least one other witness saw the UFO in the same area. Uh, in her case, it hovered near her home for about five minutes before taking off. All right, here's another case, October 1985, and this one occurred just north of Venice, Italy. It's quite a dramatic case. Ezio Zuliani and his wife Elizabeth and their four-year-old son Anthony were traveling just north of Venice along the highway when they noticed a bright light trailing their car above and behind them. And as it came lower, they could see that this object was apparently cone-shaped, and it followed them a long time, first one hour, and then two, and then three hours. And when he sped up, it would speed up. When he slowed down, it would slow down. And after hours of this, he pulled into a gas station, at which point this craft actually stopped right overhead. And as Ezio, the main witness, says, it was then that we got really scared. The thing just stopped and hovered silently over the station. Now, researchers did actually talk to this gas station attendant. His name is Walter Piccioni. And as he says, the whole area above the station was lit up like a football field with colored lights. It was amazing because there was no sound at all. In the middle of this massive circle of lights, there was this menacing craft was like a dream. So Ezio and his family continued their drive and no surprise this object continued to follow them until they reached their destination in Bergamo. And as Ezio says, we were hunted down by a UFO. Finally this object did dart off. They were still in their car and this is when Ezio noticed that the car was affected. He says, I felt the car lurch forward as if suddenly released and the thing was gone. One final case. It was May 15, 1987. This is near Springfield, Kentucky. Four women had just left church after playing bingo one evening and were heading down Highway 55 in Springfield, Kentucky and they were heading towards Lebanon, Kentucky. The four witnesses, Wanda Mathis, her sister Anita Adams, and their friends Bertha Porter and Margaret Riley all noticed a small orb of light swoop down and pace their car right outside the driver's window. This was just a tiny little light and it was quite close to them right next to their car. Anita Adams was driving and as she says, this little light came out of nowhere and appeared beside my window. And I said, y'all look, that little light's following us. It was then that she realized that she was no longer in control of the car. And as her sister says, the car stayed on the road even though she wasn't looking where she was driving. All four women felt almost hypnotized at this point. And as Wanda says, I know one thing, we were driving and driving, but we weren't getting any closer to Lebanon than we were when we started out. At one point, this orb-like object moved from the left side of the car, dipped down, and resumed position on the right side. And as Margaret says, when it came over to the right side of the car, we saw this big, shiny thing in the sky. 
It was just like it was hanging there up in the sky on the right side of the car. It was no star. There's never been a star that big and bright. And as they watched, this smaller orb zoomed up into the larger light, and then this larger craft zoomed down towards their car. And Wanda screamed out, It's coming after us. And as Anita says, I put my foot on the gas, and that's the first time I had control of the car again. And I went all over the road, first to the left and back to the right, but whatever had let us go then. The women were shaking and crying when they finally walked into the Lebanon police station to report what happened, and as police dispatcher Betty Washington says, they were shaking and carrying on. Something really scared them. I don't know what they saw, but they believed they saw something. All right, as you can see, there are no shortage of cases of this kind, and many of them are quite dramatic. And as I said in the beginning of this episode, I do think they have some important insights into ET behavior and into our own behavior. It's amazing to me how many people experience extreme fear during these encounters, even though nothing bad is really happening to them. I think these cases show how steeped in fear our society is and how a confrontation with the unknown can be quite traumatic. But as far as the ETs, like, why are they doing this? This is so bizarre. I did do a previous episode where UFOs come down and actually lift cars up into the sky. Those are called car lift cases. Uh, there aren't as many of those as there are of UFOs chasing cars down highways. So why are they doing this? I'm speculating here, but I suspect that the reason is part of a publicity campaign in which UFOs are announcing their presence to small groups of people individually or in couples, and sometimes large groups, as we see with cases involving schoolyards, perhaps, or drive-in movie theaters. I did an episode about that. Sporting events, concerts. We see this all the time. These are displays. So I suspect that's what's going on here, that UFOs are intentionally showing themselves as a way of announcing their presence and saying hello and just making it very clear to the people on the highway that UFOs are real. And I think another aspect of this is that the people driving down a highway late at night offer the ETs an opportunity to fulfill this agenda. Because this is absolutely a pattern. UFO cases are evenly divided between men and women. They happen all over the world. Almost anybody can have an encounter. But there are a huge, huge number of cases involving UFO car chases. So I think, to an extent, the ETs are t using this as an opportunity to announce their presence. I think there's also a little bit of a playful aspect here where the UFO occupants are having a little bit of fun, not in an intentionally mean or malicious way, uh, but just sort of in an almost practical joking way, <laughs> or just having a little fun announcing their presence to people in a way that leaves no doubt that UFOs are real. Again, speculation, but given the huge number of encounters of this kind, I think that's exactly what's going on here. It's just a simple introduction, a way to say, hello, we are here, we are real. So that's my episode for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to thank you very much for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep looking for answers, keep searching for the truth, and most important, keep having fun. Till next time, bye.